One of the standard terms for concentration is viharadhamma, which can be translated as a home for the mind. If you focus on the breath, you want to get the mind so that it feels at home here, and that this home is solidly built and a good place to stay. Otherwise, the mind goes roaming out looking for scraps outside to give it a little bit better pleasure. But as you go roaming around, of course, you're not protected. There's no roof over your head. There's no floor under your feet. You're exposed to all the weather. So come back inside. Part of having a house, of course, is that it has to have a good foundation. In this case, we're trying to stay with the breath consistently, regardless of whatever comes up. Some things that come up are obvious distractions, and other things are not quite so obvious. We're talking today about a sense of mental well-being that can come as you stay with the breath. But it comes and goes for a while. And there's a the temptation to try to stick with that and make it last, but that doesn't have a good foundation. That kind of pleasure, even though you can make it last for a little while as you focus on it, if you leave the breath, eventually it's all going to come tumbling down. So you get back to the breath. It's like building a house. Sometimes you can build a house on a weak foundation, but it's not going to last very long. A solid foundation takes time, and sometimes it can be dis discouraging. So when we started the monastery for years, people were giving donations and it all had to go in the ground. We had to improve the road not only in the monastery but also leading into the monastery. We had to spend a lot of water on water pipes. And after everything was agreed on the water pipes, but the county suddenly decided, well, maybe someday someone's going to build a house up on the mountain, so we want to make sure the water pipe here is big enough. And that added lots to the cost of the pipe. People would come out and say, what's happened to all the money we've donated? And we say, it's in the ground. There wasn't much to show. But now that all the foundation is in place, okay, now we can build. And the buildings will be a lot more solid. So it's the same with meditation. It takes time to get this foundation going, but it's well worth the effort. And it may not show its results right away. But you have this foundation well set, then when the time comes when you can build on it, what you build is going to be solid. An important part of this foundation is learning how to breathe in a way that gives rise to a sense of pleasure. All too often we hear that it's just, meditation is just about watching pleasure come and go, watching pain come and go, watching things, and just kind of getting out of the way and letting these things happen. But as the Buddha said, that's not the role of mindfulness. The role of mindfulness to see is to see if something is skillful. You give rise to it. You don't just let it come and go. If it seems like it's going to go, you do what you can to prevent it from going. And if it's not arising, well, do what you can to make it arise. That's when he says mindfulness becomes a governing principle in the practice. So in this case, in order to keep the mind from running out after pleasures outside, you have to give it a good, strong sense of pleasure within. And at the same time, as you have that sense of pleasure within, you find it becomes a good foundation for more skillful actions. If you have a sense of irritation inside, it's very easy to speak and do things through that irritation. And all too often, those are things you later regret. So you owe it to yourself and to other people to learn how to give rise to the sense of pleasure inside and how to maintain it. And what's special about this house is we also learn how to pick it up and move it, to make it a mobile home. In other words, this is a skill you want to develop not only while you're sitting here, but also as you go into life. This may be what the Buddha meant when he used, would use a phrase with regard to meditation, that you give it a grounding. In other words, you, literally you give it a building site. 
and also you give it a means of transport, or literally you give it a vehicle. The grounding is when you're sitting here, well, established solid here in the present moment, without any other, other things to distract you, little noises outside maybe. But the outside distractions are minimal. You're dealing totally with inside distractions, and you want to learn how to fend them off so they don't take over the mind. One important skill is learning how not to go chasing them around. In other words, just like you don't go chasing after feelings of pleasure, you don't go chasing after your distractions. You stay here with the breath. The distractions will come and go. You have to learn that you can be aware of the breath, and the distractions don't destroy the breath. You simply emphasize that part of your awareness. And the other thoughts, even though they may be there in the mind, don't have to take over. And if you don't pay attention to them, they lack their food. Because this is what feeds them, is when you pay attention. So even just paying attention just enough to chase them away, they've got you. It's worth noting that that sutta where the Buddha talks about the various ways of dealing with the distractions is named after this particular way, relaxing around the distraction. In other words, you sit here breathing, you stay with the breath, give a sense of ease with the breath, and then as other distractions come in, you begin to realize, okay, they're connected to a disturbance in the breath, so you smooth that disturbance out. Breathe right through it, and the distraction goes away. It doesn't have any place to take a stance. In other words, you don't let it have a building site. You don't let it have a grounding. You give your awareness, your ardency, your alertness, your mindfulness. Give them a grounding in here. As in a Jean Cha's Im image of being in a house with only one chair. If you let anybody else take over the chair, they're suddenly in charge of the house. So you have to sit in the chair and you have to stay there. And anything else that comes in the house has to stand. That way you're in a more comfortable position. And you can order them around. So first we give the mind a grounding as we sit here. Then we give it a vehicle. In other words, we learn how to carry it with us out into our daily lives. This doesn't happen automatically. You have to consciously take the perception of breath, or a perception of space around you, that this is your space. And the space is filled with good breath energy, and learn how to carry that with you. It's like walking and chewing gum at the same time. Repeatedly there are some people who find that hard. But most of us have learned a long time ago that there are different things that you can do at the same time. And this is one thing you want to do, is you walk around and you have this perception of breath, or the perception of your space inside. This is your safe territory, and you want to have a sense of well-being in here, because you're bringing well-being into all of your interactions with other people. That's your strength, and that's the nourishment for your well-being, otherwise it gets hungry. And then it turns into something else. So do what you can to maintain this perception of breath, energy. One way of thinking about this is that instead of thinking about the world surrounding you, your awareness of the breath surrounds your awareness of the world. You can turn tables on it. The world is moving through. It's kind of like you're watching the world. You're in the theater, and the world is a show in the theater. But the theater encompasses the stage. So there's breath all around your awareness of what other people are doing, what other people are saying. And think of the breath as larger. You can take those images that the Buddha gives of the earth as a whole, or space as a whole, or the river Ganges, which is broad and large. 
uses us to talk about goodwill, but it can use us to talk about their, your awareness of the breath as well. It's solid. It's deep. It encompasses everything that you see. So instead of taking the little bit of breath in your body out into the world, you basically allow the world into this larger arena of your breath. Again, you're in charge. That doesn't mean you can order people around, but you're in charge of what you let come into your mind. Another perception is like a force field around you. When the breath is flowing well. It's like electricity flowing well in a generator. And it creates a magnetic force field as it spins around. That way you can have a, this protective shield around you so that other people's energies don't penetrate yours. And you see them clearly. It's, the force field doesn't block your vision. You see what they need, and you're in a better position to provide it because you're not feeling threatened. And if someone comes with negative energy, it just goes right past. You don't have to suck it in. All too often we think that when we want to sympathize with somebody else, we'll subconsciously suck in their energy. Well, that's not helping them at all, and it's certainly not helping us, because then that weakens you. So you want to maintain your strong energy inside, a healthy energy, an energy of well-being. We've learned how to create this sense of well-being through the breath energy and learn how to maintain it while you're sitting here and carry it into the world. Give it the grounding, give it its vehicle, give it its means of transport, so that wherever you go, you're at home. You've got a solidly based home while you're sitting here, and you've got a good mobile home to take you around. This way you're at home wherever you go.